Hey, welcome everybody to historical research and your novel. I'm here to share my advice and my experience in researching a novel. Just a few words about me uh, and uh, just a, an audio description of what we're seeing here. I'm not going to describe every slide in perfect detail, but I want you to know uh, that I have you in mind. Uh, I'm wearing my uh, gray t-shirt, my uh, rectangly glasses, my Jerry Garcia ball cap, and I'm uh, in a blurred background that is actually my bedroom at home. Uh, and I hope everybody's doing great today. I really appreciate you being here. Just a few words about who I am. Um, yes, so I'm Steve Capone, and I am a writer and a member of the Utah, the League of Utah Writers. I've been a member for the last three years. My first meeting was just before the pandemic. So a lot of those three years have been spent online, but I am enjoying getting back in person with folks. The conferences are a highlight of my year, twice a year, and I'm glad you're with me. I have degrees, uh, multiple degrees in uh, English, the humanities, philosophy, a couple of master's degrees. I've been teaching for the last 15 years. I have a short story that has appeared in the ink pot, and I have a forthcoming novel with Gib Smith called Jimmy versus Communism, and that's actually going to be our case study today. A couple of times I'm going to refer to it specifically to help show how I've used historical research to inform the writing of that novel. So let's get right into it. And um, this is the agenda. There are six items on the agenda. Uh, the what is its for section is going to be about the spectrum of uses for historical research in our writing, like what kinds of things um, would we use our historical research for? The next is resource targeting. So what is out there in the world? How do you choose what you need for your project? It's really helpful to know what you're looking for at the beginning here. And number three is finding targeted resources. So being those that you've selected or aim, the ones that you're aiming for, how do you find them? Uh, plus, I've got a sample search in here. Uh, the next is don't get stuck. How much research is too much or not enough? Then uh, that, that's actually the hardest thing, I think, for a lot of us is we get on tangents. We uh, we get too interested in something. We're curiosos by our nature, maybe. And so we want to know everything. But you don't need to know everything to write an excellent historical fiction book, even one that's really well researched. Next is curating and tracking. This is the fifth item on the list, tracking what you find. How do you report it? How do you record it? Uh, let's make that a little bit more manageable. And I have an example there too. And then incorporating research, just a little bit of discussion about what you will do with all you found. And this is the this is the place where I actually think uh, it is the, it's a sixth of the presentation, but it's probably the thing that might be most useful because you can often hear from authors who are not experts at research, and then you can hear at the same time from researchers who are not expert authors. But um, in my case, I, I would suggest that you definitely have uh, here for you an expert professional researcher and somebody who is a paid author. So you've got both of those things going, and I can help you think about how to use the research you found. You're not going to put everything you found into your book. That would be a disaster, but we might be inclined to, well, we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, this is the next slide, and we've got a heading here uh, for the first section, why research? And I want you to think about it. Um, most writers aren't also historians, but historical research is often crucial to our writing process. And we think about a sliding scale of what historical research is for, and we've got that spectrum here showing with inspiration at one end of the spectrum. and context for the other and we can think about our book as probably needing more of one or more of the other we might we might begin researching just to inspire us give us some ideas we might be just doing a ton of reading to generate some ideas and i've definitely had story and book ideas from reading history but we also at we're looking at maps or images i mean those are definitely all legit uses for your research on the far other side of the spectrum, you might have a perfectly clear vision of what your story is going to be about, and you may set out with that in mind, seeking specific bits of uh, resources to help you with, uh, with your story. And of course, there are different layers or different sorts of historical fiction. You might be using research to inspire a fantastic world that is not 
of our world uh, and the audience may never know that you've used that that you've done any research so this this talk applies even if you're a fantasy author you don't have to be writing historical fiction although that's my context we'll look at that as kind of our guide but you could be anywhere on the scale and all of this might yet be useful so the second this is another title slide for the second bit of the talk and this is all kind of just getting into it the resource uh, targets so how do you how do you decide what resource knowing what resources are out there what do you need to target for your project what are you looking for and we'll go over now the most common resources and i have two pages on this so I'll just show you both real quick we've got five items and running across this numbered line like a number line we've got newspapers maps still images video audio as number three First hand accounts is number four, second hand accounts, et cetera, as number five. So newspapers, and this is why you'd want each, think about uh, what, what what is it that you need these resources for? You might, with a newspaper, identify the culture and political kind of air of the era, the, the milieu of the era. Uh, you might wanna search for specific important places or events or people. It, like if you're if you are writing about Muhammad Ali, you might want to just do a newspaper search for Muhammad Ali. Um, maps are number two. It helps me at least to get a handle on the physical space of what I'm writing about, whether that's inspiring a fantastic setting or it is a literal like I want to get this right, which is the case in my in my book project and in my last couple of book projects. They were set in 1965 Berlin, so needed to know what stuff looked like back then had to go out seeking it took me an in-person visit to a stasi prison in germany to get that map but maps of all sorts are really um really useful for helping us also to see how demographics or other bits of information might overlay on top of those maps and of course other kinds of media number three still images or videos or audio, you might want to see things in focus. There might be news reels about the era or about the specific event you're writing about. Also, I love to look at art from the era. Now, that might be if you're writing about the 1600s, then maybe you're just looking at paintings from the, the region where you're writing. You want to know what's popular at the time, what's in what what people are talking about and of course we're talking about what some folks consider to be important this is is not universal but it's still pretty helpful especially in the 20th century we can go back and we can listen to what they were playing on the radio what were the number one hits that year what were the books that were popular what were what people were reading what movie theater attendance was like and what movies they were going to see and so on and so forth. First-hand accounts, of course, primary sources, usually called primary sources. If the person had direct access to the event, that's a primary source. First-hand accounts, I, I use a little bit more loosely than that, but we definitely wanna use those first-hand accounts to improve our understanding about somebody else's perspective, get in a bit of empathy and access those emotions that I don't really know about without reading about them. Uh, or maybe find something analogous to my own experience so I can link my experience to it as a writer. Get firsthand information about a time or a place, an event, a person. Uh, we also would want, like I was teaching about um, the slave trade last year and, and we had some accounts of enslaved people. Actually, the only the only readings incidentally that we did the, that week when we were focused on the slave trade was from ins formerly enslaved people. And so that was like, hey, firsthand account. I don't, I'm not gonna give you the textbook version of this. We're gonna talk around this and try to understand it together, but here are the voices of those people directly. And the students really appreciated that as well as me. Secondhand accounts. You can get a summary of events. Uh, you can survey a whole swath of history, and we'll talk about that in a second. Get an interpretation of events and their significance as, a, as compared with other events in the era. And sometimes these secondhand accounts will do that comparing for you, or you might just have two accounts. Um, I, I also think of it as a way of altering, though probably not removing, some of the biases involved with first-hand accounts there might be somebody who does a survey of history for you and so they can analyze historiography is the study of like how history is told and how people talk about history and that's often interesting i i went at one point i, I read this book about the history of uh, jerusalem 
as written by some dude in the 1800s in Britain and the history of Jerusalem from that guy's point of view was bonkers. But I loved it. I really enjoyed it because it was about that guy's bias. It was about his perspective on those things. I wasn't reading it so that I could understand the truth about everything about the history of Jerusalem. I just wanted to know, what is this dude from Britain, this colonial empire, think about about this territory, Palestine? Um, and yeah, so we want to mention this distinction between a specific topic in history versus a survey of history. So let's think of examples, a specific, uh, an example of a survey of history might be Susan Wise Bauer's uh, The Ancient World was, is phenomenal. Uh, or we could do like, there's a book called The New History of the Cold War. I think it's in my um, bibliography later in this presentation. That's like all about the whole Cold War era from the communist revolution all the way up until the collapse and beyond. And then there are specific titles that are about specific events. So one of the books I read read recently, well, in the last couple of years was um, called Berlin 1961, something, something, the most dangerous place in the world. And that's just about one year leading up to the building of the Berlin Wall and what the tensions were at the time and what led to that. So depending on your era, you would probably want some surveys, some specifics. Uh, I, I see surveys as a really good place to start. And sometimes I think about Wikipedia as giving a survey type perspective as opposed to a specific perspective. Um, Wikipedia, of course, a great place to start, never a place to finish. Short fiction, so, okay, next slide. What are your project goals? Short fiction and long fiction, of course, have different, are gonna require different things of you. Um, nonfiction is a totally different ball game and poetry, I just, want to say do what you feel I'm not the poet and ask a poet but um, maybe historical research would be informative or interesting um, as a point of inspiration for poetry so uh, in short fiction you don't need to be an expert but don't write anything that people are going to catch on to as obviously false unless it's intentional so just you don't want to annoy or anger your reader and one thing I'll be harping on throughout this talk is like the point of the research is to make the world believable. It is not to show the author or the reader everything that you know about the thing. It's a thing I used to do and still I catch myself in first drafts that, and I have to extract that stuff. I want to like tell them all, tell the audience all about like the kinds of televisions that were available in 1951. Um, and nobody is as enthusiastic about that as I am. So that stuff has to go in draft two. Uh, long form fiction, this is what we might think of as a danger zone because there is potentially no end at all to this. Um, the range will vary widely based on your project goals. So if you are um, writing something at one end of the spectrum that's wholly fantasy, uh, you're gonna, your, your needs are gonna only be based on what you need to get inspired. And if on the other hand, you're doing something on, on the other end of a spectrum, that is really highly driven by the specifics of the era, then you're gonna to have to become an expert on that era. That's what I'm attempting to do for this book. And that's what I attempted to do for my last few. Um, and it's very similar actually to the nonfiction book, although not quite to that level. I think of this as writing long form fiction, I need like master's level of expertise about the thing. Whereas if you're writing nonfiction, you'd be better, you had better be at that PhD level. And what that, that means is, you need to build that annotated bibliography and then read everything that has ever been printed on the subject. There's no other way to do it. Um, so I don't go that far with my long form fiction. Uh, I, I am reading a dozen books, not dozens upon dozens upon dozens. Um, and I've got journal articles and that, and I'll show you. Um, page or section three, this is a, another header page, finding targeted resources. How do I find the resources that I want to find once I target those resources? For newspapers, you can look at both newspapers.com, which is run by Ancestry, and it is not free, but I have found it to be really worth my 50, 60 bucks um, to, to be able to use it because of all the papers they have accessible, and you can clip and make uh, G JPEGs and PDFs and all of that stuff to help uh, build a little a, a digital archive for myself. Library of Congress has quite a few newspapers in their 
um, databases, a lot of them accessible online. There will be other places where you'll find databases of newspapers as well. Maps you can find at the Library of Congress. They have a whole section about maps. Uh, there are university research projects like University of Pittsburgh has one. I mean, and I'm talking about my project as the sample case here, but University of Pittsburgh has one that's specific to Pittsburgh. UVA uh, has mapping inequality, which is not specific to any particular area, and we'll show you that later. Uh, many states and local governments do have mapping archives. Some of them can only be accessed in person. Many of them, most of them at this point are online. And then there are some weird kind of nonprofit situations where they have archives or private libraries, that kind of thing. Um, I found a, the P Pennsylvania Trolley Museum has a lot of interesting archives, and that is not a it's not a, a research project at a university, nor is it a state or local government thing, nor is it a Library of Congress thing. The third category of still images or videos, that's moving pictures or audio. The Library of Congress, again, has great databases. There are other universities, again, also independent archives, like the American Archive of Public Broadcasting at AmericanArchive.org. Or in the sample case of Pittsburgh, the Heinz History Center, which exists at the Heinz History Museum in Pittsburgh in person, but they have some library archives online. Firsthand accounts, I actually think this is a reasonable way to start. Uh, you can start with Googling to find initial sources, figure out who knows about the thing, look up their um, Look up their research lists. Don't be afraid to do that. And then if you're on Wikipedia, follow through those uh, that article down to their sources and look at, like, make a list from the citations and then find those sources and then find those sources sources. See if you can track down the end of that line of sources. Find excerpts in historical surveys. Sometimes these firsthand accounts do appear. Next is secondhand accounts, survey textbooks, nonfiction survey books like that aforementioned Susan Weisbauer um, or the new Cold War or a really phenomenal American history one called From Colony to Superpower, 1776 to Present. Check the citations in those nonfiction texts and look for those references at the back of anything you discover. Be careful. This is an explosive method, explosive as in exploding diagram, things getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's explosive. Where to begin your search? Continued. Please don't forget that um, research librarians, they have an interest in helping you. I've gotten help from the Carnegie Mellon folks, the Penn State University librarians as well. And I'm talking about real people where I just emailed some, hey, we can help you at this email address and, and told them what the project was in one line, told them what my question was as quickly as possible, and then just asked. And I had similar luck asking the editor, there was like editor in chief contact on the United Steelworkers, USW, Union History, on their on their newsletter site, I found the contact, I emailed the person, that person emailed me back with really helpful information. Um, you know, find the experts, figure out who does the thing, who learns about the thing that you want to know about, and then ask them. I got help from some urban studies professors at University of Pittsburgh, just with a simple email. Again, keep it really short, don't be long-winded, you have to know exactly what you're asking, or you will not get even if they're trying to be helpful, you're not going to get helpful information. And remember that they're not there to work for you. So if you send them a long email, they might just ignore it. But sending the email one line, here's my project, and make it sound official and important because you are official and important. My book is coming out next year. Uh, it's about this. I'd really like to get this info right. And I've heard that you have expertise in this area. Here is my question. Thank you very much. Sincerely, blah, blah, blah. I found it. I, I also found that um, a, the woman who runs the homesteadhebrews.com website, which was phenomenal, I contacted her directly, asked her a question. She responded. She seemed so into it that I asked her if she was willing to look at my bibliography, and she considered. They, she suggested a few things to add, and she gave me some corrections. Next, and this is kind of like an expansion on the third section on finding our targeted resources gaining access. Some libraries require special efforts. Here's a quote from Samuel Beckett, just cuz I tried to groan, help, help. But the tone that came out was of polite, polite conversation. Isn't it a, a delight? I love Samuel Beckett. Okay, so most university libraries do have guest access passes, especially if you attend. 
If you have a library card, I don't think I have this in this presentation officially, but if you have a library card, uh, I was reminded of this at the Life, the Universe and Everything conference the other day, you can you can often log into databases like, like EBSCO. You can't get the full database business um, on, with your library card, but universities have it. Sometimes guest hack access will include some database access. Usually it does not. Sometimes you can only look at things in person, but they have collections of journals. And if you find the journal, you can go find the article, right? If you're an adjunct, and I, I have kind of like kept my adjuncting going in part so I can just constantly have access to databases, you can use their research databases. It's also easy to get a library card from the Library of Congress. Not that you need one necessarily, but because there is a huge collection online, more about this later. But if you think it would be cool to go through some tunnels under uh, the streets in DC. There's this, it feels like a top secret, super fun way of getting your library card in person. Uh, that was closed for a while during COVID, but I think it's back open now. And then of course, presidential libraries are things that we don't often think about, but really useful for researchers, open to online searches. And then also make sure you set this up in advance. You can often just go and visit. Um, but the other thing is um, that generally, that personal research libraries or private research libraries might be acceptable or accessible if appointments are made in advance. Now, the, the Heinz History Center is an example of this kind of a private library. It is not owned by the city or the some, some um, educational organization. It is owned by the Heinz History Center, and you have to make an appointment to go there. Uh, the Library of Congress, I think you might need to make an appointment to go do some research there, but I mean, it would be worth it. Uh, send a kind request to these private libraries. Don't assume that because the website says they're not open to the public that they won't let you in because you are, you're a writer and you matter, you're important. Um, okay, so we're gonna do this sample search. Hopefully the volume here is on point. Beware, I'm about to play a YouTube video inside my recorded video. So let's just be aware. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show you a few websites that I found uh, in part through Googling. Hopefully by, by this point, it, it's clear that I got some recommendations from um, some outside folks. Um, and some of these I found through Googling. And the kind of Googling I'm doing is like um, historical maps, Pittsburgh, or Homestead, Pennsylvania, 1951, uh, so that's the time when my story takes place, 1951 map, there might be something dozen or two dozen variations of those things that I looked at to get these databases. But as I mentioned earlier, these were useful databases, but sometimes it's tricky to know how to use them. And if I'm going to go over it quickly, I, I, I'm in a situation here where probably a third of the people in the room have done this before and it's no big deal. A third of the people have never seen anything like this, and a third of the people this will be like right on target for. So I'm going to give a little introduction to, as an example uh, run through for using some of these resources. I, I really liked the Hopkins maps that I found here. A look through will let you know that different neighborhoods of Pittsburgh are represented in uh, different uh, maps. And because I already did a broader search, I know what neighborhood my story is taking place in. The Homestead map in particular from what, 1903 or something it said. Go to item description. Oh, 1900. So I look at this knowing that it is probably changed. And through doing other research and reading, I know that all of this stuff right here was removed around the time of the Second World War to expand the Homestead Works. And in fact, probably stretches all the way out to here. Um, all those lower districts, uh, all those lower housing areas have been wiped out by the steel industry. Hey, I was looking for um, names of streets uh, to make sure that I have old names. And I can also cross-reference this with other maps it looks like Sanborn maps are available across the country. Okay, this is newer, slightly newer. And this is one where you're going to have all the different zones broken into uh, these numbered 
plates over here or numbered pages. So by clicking on any of them, you get the, the view of that very narrow, that very particular place. The first one is the overhead or the overview. And so you can zoom in on certain areas. Again, this is the unexpanded works because that didn't happen until the 40s. I think that my character lives on 18th Street. So maybe I would need number 24 or number 14. I also want to have him east of McClure. That's McClure going running uphill. This is all uphill. And so I know what the alleys are. I know what the, uh, maybe I can cross reference with this to find the addresses. And this is really a terrifying and useful map for a lot of purposes, but it gives you racial characteristics of neighborhoods um, at a time when loans were made or not made based on people's um, projected reliability, which is a terrifying thing just to think about um, when what we thought at the time, what people thought at the time, what white people thought at the time was that a neighborhood is like more lendable, like more reliably lendable than another neighborhood if they are um, more white. Areas by grade. This is Homestead down here. And the Homestead High Level Bridge, maybe. Um, so if you look lower in the area, down by the where the plant replaces this zone later on, um, it's mostly poorer people. Um, I don't know what you know eight hundred dollars would buy in nineteen forty, but or so. But you could look that up. You know, get a get a calculator, um, and you can see how like who who lives in that zone, uh, what kind of folks live in that zone. Uh, whether there are immigrants, whether there are people of color. So what this does is it gives me a clearer view of who lives in the area. I mean, if this is this is correct in 1940, I might say, well, I need to get even more uh, specific, in which case I want to look up the census data and the 1950 census data is available. But let's say I wanted to see more of it and look at this huge number of available online items in the Library of Congress. I love the Library of Congress. I use it for teaching and I use it for my books. Let's go to an online image. We might pick a date. And here we go. Uh, Steelworks, we can get the date for each of them. We might want to sort by oldest to newest, I guess. And actually you can maybe Get more specific, Homestead, Homestead Steelworks. And I can see what the steel mills actually looked like here. And just through doing Googling, I've also found like US Steel has these promotional videos from the 40s and the early 50s that are pretty wild. Hopefully what you're getting here is this idea that even if you have a really specific thing in mind, and actually the more specific, the better, you can find quite a lot on the uh, Library of Congress. Oh. Cool. And hopefully we get a year with each of them. There's no year. Documentation compiled after 68. So that means it's from before 68. And then you have building structure dates. So we don't have a specific year it looks like. Um, oh, look, at it. it's very helpful to cite the item. You'll find that all over Library of Congress. So this is just an example of some of the stuff you can find if you're trying to zero in on and get a hang up the hang of a location. What I also do is I will go to the Google Maps street view of the place. And then sometimes what I'll, I'll find myself getting a lot out of is comparing the Google street view to some of these images that I might find. And there are city images and skylines and that kinds of that kind of thing here. And uh, yes, we've already used the Sanborn map. I actually printed a high res copy of this and put it on my wall. Um, to help me have a point of reference. I have this overview one, and then I have just the one for my uh, little district where my, my guy lives. Um, there's a ballpark at 19th. Right here is a ballpark um, that I identified because I got some good info from one of the fellows at um, University of Pittsburgh. And we want to skip that. We want to look for the .gov. As of last year, the 1950, because there's a 72 year wait for whatever reason, but 1950 
census is online. This one gets way more in depth, um, but I have gone so far as to find the enumeration districts that my character would have lived in. And then I found um, every person's like name, uh, ethnicity, uh, what job they work, how many hours they worked the last week, according to when it was reported, um, their income for the prior year. So be, like a huge amount of the actual information is available. Um, and I would encourage you to use census data. It is available after 1950 in the aggregate. So if you want to know about neighborhoods and what characterizes a neighborhood, the census is a great place to look. Um, but if you go to 1950 or earlier, you can find all of the detail. Oh, thanks, Steve. I almost made a uh, like, hello, John, hello, John, kind of a self-referential joke there. And we're going to get back into my regular presentation here. Uh, this, uh, the stuff on YouTube uh, is definitely accessible to you. Uh, you can get this slide deck. If you email me, you can get links to any of the videos, anything I have, you're welcome to basically. And so we're on to the next title slide, which is how to avoid getting stuck. It's really easy to get stuck. We don't want to get trapped in our focus. So I would suggest that if you're like me, it would work probably well to read very broadly, read those surveys, and then narrow your focus based on what you get a vibe that you need to know. And sometimes we have to start writing before we get that kind of more specific feeling. Then it's important that we write. Remember why we're researching, we have to write or we are not making progress at some point. I mean, it is good to do research, but if what we do for three years is research without writing a word, we're actually not writing. Uh, that's maybe I'm, maybe I'm taking a, giving you a hot take, but it, it's most important to write. As we go, we'll need to stop and find answer, find answers to specific questions, but keep the questions that we're searching for answers focused on the present thing, the present question, the present mission. Keep notes to answer the questions. You might keep a note of the question and then look it up later. Uh, you might want to pause to get a specific, like I had to pause at one point to say, what trolley number would these kids have ridden from uh, Homestead to Pittsburgh? And it took me 20 minutes to find the answer to that question to a pretty certain degree. If if I'm not finding it in 20 to 30 minutes, it's unlike, unlikely my audience will, but I do like to be as sure as I can get. So I, I was satisfied that I had the right answer. Um, remember to keep writing and then read more. I, I find it very helpful. And I understand that this might be overwhelming for folks whose brain doesn't work exactly like mine does. And I don't presume that yours is exactly like mine, but when I run out of writing energy, if I'm still trying to stay in the zone, I'll get like audiobooks about the era. I will try to watch movies about the era. Like I'm trying to make my life about this project and it helps me. And it, often I'll have ideas for stories from things that seem to be unrelated. Uh, the, and I know you probably know how that is. The next title slide here is for number five, part five of six, curating and tracking your resources. And we're gonna have another video in here, but I can talk you through it. Do not fear the bibliography. And remember that it is your friend. You should make a bibliography. What's it for? Well, it's to track what you've seen so far and what you wanna save for later, what you wanna consider later. Here's why you need one. You can't remember everything you've consulted. You can't. If you are some magic human, um, even if you if, if you are that magic human who can remember it all, you really ought to be conserving that brain power for writing, not wasting your brain cells remembering things. You only have so much room up there. Um, even if the resources are all in hard copy right in front of you, you need notes about the sources. Just having a stack of books doesn't do you much good when you need an answer to a specific question. So remember that a bibliography is a record of your research documents or whatever media you're looking at, maybe not documents. Uh, and it really gets better, it levels up, and it becomes more useful to you when you annotate it, when you put helpful reminders about what sources are useful, who gave you the source, um, who to thank later, that, that kind of stuff. And let's think about this for easy 
construction, here's a, here are some tips. Remember, don't fear the bibliography. I add everything I consult right when I consult it. It has to be done when the item is found or it will become overwhelming. Just adding a thing to a list, I always keep the tab open, research with the name of the book there, and I just add things one at a time. It's no big deal to just copy and paste a link in there, but if you're trying to go back and recreate your trail, forget about it. That's a potentially project killing problem. The next thing is you don't have to do it the way they made you do it in school unless you're creating a bibliography for peer review. Um, in which case, there's probably some style that you need to follow. Remember that your editors might count as your peers who would want to review your bibliography. So whatever you do, just keep it consistent. Uh, and you'll see that mine is not perfect. And I go through a few, like what you see actually now, um, this is the East Germany stuff. So, so this is a completed bi bibliography. Um, and it is not uh, proper formatting for submission to an academic journal. But I, I got as close as I could, and I tried to just be consistent inside these categories. And the categories wouldn't appear like this if this were a nonfiction, um, not nonfiction book. But this helped me to keep everything uh, in in mind, involved uh, in the right in the right places. And yeah, so that's my that's my my sample for Max and the Capital of Spies, the last book that I wrote. Still trying to find a home for that one. Um, probably have to rewrite it. I know that you may be able to relate. relate. Um, and then let's move to the next one. And this is the in progress one. This is what it looks like when it's still rough because I'm very much still in the middle of this progress process. And now look, I've, I've come to like tables. I like to build tables and then I try to separate. I mentioned Cold War and New History. Uh, you'll see I like started, I went through a period where I was like trying to check mark things as I read them. And then uh, I haven't read all these things yet, uh, but I've read probably a third of them. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I've got journal articles here. They're not really all uniform yet. I've just been doing a lot of copying and pasting and trying to put things like when they offer me a click here for the citation, I'll just copy the thing they give me. Uh, then I have just links to the things that I'm using. You can get see, get a vibe for all of the research I've um, done or know that I need to look at. Most of this stuff, I looked at everything that, that you're seeing here. Um, skip ourselves ahead. Uh, these are like all newspaper articles. Thanks, newspapers.com. I wish you were paying me and not me paying you homage, homage uh, in my presentation. But... Um, yeah, it, it's a big it's a big list, um, and that's because I am putting down everything I look at. And any time I have a question, I add more to it. Oh, there's the map. That's right, you know that map. Um, and I have just a list of maps. And the thanks to Michael Glass of Pitts, Pitts, University of Pittsburgh. Um, I also just wrote down some questions to answer later, and some of them I've answered, and some of them I have not. Um, and yeah, just a timeline from University of Pittsburgh. That's pretty much it. So there's what it looks like when I'm in in process. And I'll be happy to share anything you want to look at. I'm, I will share it with you. The, the last thing we'll talk about is how to incorporate your research. And this is really like, I'm going to feel like this is probably the most important thing, but also the thinnest. It is really much better put as a conversation or a workshop as opposed to a one-way conversation. So I'll give you what I've got here. Um, these are just, as I'm thinking about it, the things that are most important to incorporate. This is section six now, the last section. Stick to the action. So if you wanna write an essay, great. Keep it out of your manuscript. Uh, sometimes I find that I've written a section that reads like an essay and I just copy and paste it into my little notes section in Scrivener or you know you can keep a doc document open or whatever like great essays are fine you can put them on your website or you can hand them to readers as a bonus or what what have you give them a peek behind the scenes but any research that you actually include in the words on the page it should serve the action of the scene we also want to stick to the point of view character whether well Point of view character or the point of view if it's broader than just a character don't lose track of that if you get um if you get really into describing the room that the person is in but it's not really involved involving that person 
the reader will be distracted and will be drawn out of their suspension of disbelief. You can't cheat on this unless you're Aaron Sorkin, who for some reason gets away with this and we're not as annoyed, at least I'm not as annoyed. You can't info dump with a character without being using some sleight of hand about it. Um, if you're familiar with the West Wing or really anything Aaron Sorkin has done, there's always some scene where a character's like, I'm Josh Lyman, I attended Harvard, blah, blah, blah. And then they give you the whole background of all the characters because they're talking to one another in a kind of jokey way. We don't we don't get to do that. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna show you an example of how I try to do these three things given it's actually a, a collage of research. Um, and I will just, uh, I'll just read this thing to you. Jimmy stared north past the German savings and deposit bank beyond the stacks of the American sheet and tin Mon River works and across the Mon River toward downtown Pittsburgh. Just above the stacks, he spotted the new skyscraper, the 41 story William Penn Place Tower, where U.S. Steel was setting up what he was sure were extra fancy offices. Jimmy didn't want to work in the mill like his dad, carrying home with him layers of soot that would never wash off. James Sr. was a leader and that part was good, but he could keep the rest of it. The rest of it he could keep, I should say. Jimmy didn't say this aloud, of course, but he would he would work in an office building like the one U.S. Steel was setting up. Only he'd work, he'd be working for the FBI or a police red squad, doing whatever had to be done to round up the bad guys. So there's actually a lot happening in here. If I were to start pointing to the various resources, it really is an amalgamation of quite a lot of different things. I didn't just go to one resource and then turn that into a paragraph. Um, I'm thinking about this character, how the character is developing, his relationship with his dad, his relationship with the city, how he thinks about work, what he thinks is important. No, he wants to work for the FBI. A couple of last notes, um, and I would just suggest to remember that the purpose of your research is to support your writing. And that good research, effective research, can help you lower the audience's resistance to willingly suspending their disbelief. Anything that might trigger them to remember that what they're reading is contrived, and I would suggest to you that every bit of writing is always contrived, but we want people to forget about it. That would be our number one enemy. The job of well-researched scenes or scene elements is to hide the research and highlight the action. This is like my biggest mess up. If you look at the drafts I did of my first two books before this one, my critique partners in the Salt Lake Writers Group can probably tell you all about this. But there's like, I was so excited about the scene, about the place that I wrote it. The character tends to disappear out of my descriptions. So I, I really think that I've made a lot of progress when I look at this kind of a scene. It's not perfect, this is draft number one, but whatever, it's, it's better. And this is a place where I think all of us, you know, need to be, be remembering. Uh, that the point of research is to support our writing. So thank you so much for attending. This is my final slide. Uh, you can catch me outside at Steve Capone Jr. at author dot or Steve Capone Jr. author at gmail dot com at Capone Teaches on Twitter, Capone Teaches dot com. I've got a Facebook page that is just my author page. I just post stuff about authory things. My LinkedIn page, and um, this. This author is looking for a job this year, looking for a change. So if you've got any leads, you, you let me know. I'm not so high and undignified that I'm not willing to just say that. But um, I would love to talk more about this. I hope we have time for Q&A, but please reach out to me if you're not comfortable with the Q&A stuff. Uh, thank you again for attending. Ciao.